Hello everyone, I'm Jim Durward, the president of Endatalize Corp. And I'm here today with Dr. Kelty Duggan. And today, Dr. Duggan and I will be discussing the state of the mental health system, the causes of some of the problems of the system, and how we can improve the system. So Dr. Duggan, do you think there's a problem with the mental health system? Yes, I think there is a problem in the mental health system big time because um, as we've seen through the pandemic and all the attention on it, those problems have existed for a while and it's just mainly in terms of access um, and, and patients realizing they have issues and getting, and getting the help they need in a timely manner. You speak of an access problem. Could you elaborate on that? I think access to mental health care is challenging for people on many levels. So there could be the people struggling at home who are suffering from mental health and aren't even really sure what's wrong. They may be struggling, they may be self-medicating. Then there's people who are trying to access care and there can be barriers. So they might be trying to see a counselor, a therapist, and there are cost issues, or um, they may be seeing their family doctor and their family doctor is very busy and only has maybe 10 to 15 minutes um, due to the pressures that they have in their clinic. And then lastly, to see a psychiatrist can be very challenging because there are so many people in need and the wait lists for psychiatrists can be very long. When you refer to a psychiatrist, how is urgency dealt with? Is there some sort of uh, mental triage in effect there in these communications? The way it works right now is a lot of people struggling with mental health issues are managed by family doctors. And I love family doctors and I know they work very hard, um, but it can be difficult to have enough time to manage all of the mental health. Um, so if someone's very ill, we tend to end up using the emergency system. So if someone is very unwell psychiatrically. Family physician may be calling a psychiatrist, but that person has to meet that criteria of severity to get the attention that they might need in an emergency setting. So there is a form of mental health triage, but it's often based on a not fully informed diagnosis. That's correct. So some people have conditions that are less severe and family doctors have been for years managing these patients and some patients are doing well with that. So they aren't referred on. Um, some patients may be resistant to medication or the therapy, and in those situations, a family doctor may want to refer. Some people have more serious uh, symptoms or serious family history, so there may be some reason to refer to the psychiatrist, but it's not urgent. But those people will wait much longer. Uh, I don't want to say psychiatrists don't see less serious conditions because they do uh, want to care for all kinds of patients, but they're sort of forced by the fact that the system is short, that they end up mostly treating the most severe conditions. So a lot of people remain under the care of their family doctor who may not have any specific mental health training and very little time to come to a diagnosis. And often they will rely on very short subjective self-reporting questionnaires as the basis for prescribing drugs. Uh, what do you think about that process? Well, I think family doctors definitely go to continuing education and try to increase their knowledge um, about psychiatric medications and treatment over time. Some of them have done special training in GP psychotherapy and so forth. I think that being limited by a 10 or 15 mis minute visit is the biggest issue. And some of these questionnaires are, are not very detailed, so they don't really um, allow the physician to get a great amount of detail. That is true. That's a problem. So the depth of a mental health diagnosis is actually limited by a lack of time and by economic constraints. A lot of people don't understand. Physician salaries are often reported as um, a gross number, but that's actually a small business. And so physicians are paying overhead at free market rates, but they have a single payer system from the government, which hasn't really adjusted rates for many years. So physicians are extremely pressed and you'll see a lot of family doctors are giving up their practices because they just simply can't afford to keep the doors open. They're paying for staff, you know, computers, um, their overhead leases and everything. So it, it does create a, a situation where they have to see a certain number of patients per day to meet their expenses. And then, you know, it's, it's just becoming increasingly difficult because the government and the system hasn't really focused on primary care at the level that we need. So what is actually involved in a mental health diagnosis? Well, family physicians are extremely hardworking and caring, and they often will see the patient multiple times before they settle on a diagnosis. They may have a working diagnosis. They may recommend dietary and lifestyle changes before medication. So we normally and typically don't just jump to medication, and that's not our training. So to be fair to family docs, I think they do take their time. Um, they take the history, they get the, you know, the genetic, um, 
or sorry, the family history. They uh, look at symptoms. They look at the patient's physical examination and behavior. They put it all together, finding out what supplements they're on, medications, are they taking substances? Often if there's substance use, that clouds the diagnosis. So it's very, it's not a simple thing to get to a, a psychiatric diagnosis. It's, it's complex. So what are the main factors that slow down the diagnostic process? Well, I mean, some people come in with a clear cut anxiety. Uh, it's pretty clear they've been suffering at home. They haven't come to the doctor. They have classic panic disorder, classic anxiety symptoms. That can be more um, clear cut in a, in a visit. Um, depression is a little tougher. There can be subtler signs. People might not recognize some of their symptoms and you're sort of asking the questions about the symptoms of depression, but also educating at the same time. And, and, and you might want to see that patient a couple of times. Also, depressions have different patterns. They can be more agitated or they can be very sleepy and down. And, and there's just different aspects to depression. So sometimes that will affect getting the diagnosis. And so because of the complexity, it takes some time. How much time? It varies. Honestly, I'm not in everyone's office. I'm sure some physicians are, you know, because of time pressure, they may go quicker. Um, others may do the multiple visits and I've seen both approaches. What do you think about prescribing treatment before having a fully informed diagnosis? I think that can happen. I think some patients are coming in, they're not sleeping, they can't function at work, they want a medication, they've read about an antidepressant. And so, you know, there's, there's sometimes similar to antibiotics, sometimes there's pressure from the patients themselves. And I think physicians do try to pause and educate, but some physicians will just probably prescribe quickly. And that is something that, um, you know, ideally you would have more time. But I don't think any family physician wants to do things quickly. It's just unfortunate, the economic and time pressure and also patient demand. It seems like lack of time is a major contributor to an underinformed diagnosis and that such a diagnosis can lead to um, improper drug prescription events. The thing that's challenging about psychiatry in general is that some patients respond differently to medications. And I know personalized medicine is coming and we'll be able to type medications more to the unique person, but it's sometimes the diagnosis may be correct, but the treatment is not effective. It may need to be changed. And so you'll see patients that are sometimes tried on two and three different medications before they find the right one for them. And that can be frustrating. Um, misdiagnosis, I do see sometimes patients are labeled um, bipolar or schizoaffective and and then it can change years later they're labeled with something else and and you have to wonder and and i think it has to do with the fact that the patient has changed their symptomatology has changed as well so psychologists are brilliant and they're they spend a lot of time they can go into great detail and depth they have an hour with the patient which is very different than a family doctor so it is a, it is interesting right and a lot of family doctors use and refer psycho to psychologists because they need that teamwork. Here in Canada, family physician fees are covered by healthcare, but psychologists' fees are not, even though psychologists are fully trained in matters of the mind. This seems to be a very big problem with the mental health system. Can you comment on this? I think that if we really are serious about putting mental health dollars where it helps, we should be funding psychology and therapists, for sure. I believe that too. There are professionals with specific training in matters of the mind and who have the time available to come to a fully informed diagnosis. What they don't have are the billing codes that allow them to get paid by the government health plans or private health plans for that matter. Why not? What, what, what is the holdup here? I think it's a resource issue. I think, um, you know, if I compare what a doctor gets for a visit for that 10 minutes, it's a lot less than what a psychologist gets yes, for their hour. Yeah. Considerably different. It's like, it's, and like, it's like a third. It, very, well, after they pay their overhead, it's it's minuscule amount that the family doctor gets actually. So I do think that the reason it hasn't evolved towards having publicly funded um, psychology and therapy services, it's the cost. And so people often get it through their EAP, like their employee assistance programs, if you're employed, but, but those who aren't fortunate enough to be employed, um, there's just that access issue. Some would say it's the doctors themselves that don't want the psychologists involved. 
I, I, I don't think so at all. In fact, in my doctor's I hope you're right. I hope you're right. My Facebook doctor group, often physicians will post a question because we share questions with each other. Who's a great psychologist for this problem? Who's a great psychologist for that problem? We recognize we do not have the time to spend doing the therapy. We, and, and one of the great uh, teachers of my psychiatric training said, you know, often the medication can be a rope, but the therapist is helping the person pull themselves out of the hole. So you often use both in tandem, and that's why there should be collaboration. If you had a, a primary care clinic that had, you know, physicians helping with the medication, therapists helping with therapy, uh, asthma educators, diabetes educators, you know, this sort of primary care home where you would have all the people that help us be well, that would probably be a better system, and that's what I would love to see funded. A typical psychologist billing rate is about $200 an hour. Uh, a primary physician, on the other hand, for providing psychotherapeutic services will be paid probably less than half of that. How do we deal with this differential? You know, if you look at countries that have public and private systems, both. If you have your workers working in both systems, everyone benefits. So if you're a psychologist and you want a private practice, you have a percent of your time you do that. And perhaps you do a tour in the hospital and in the clinics where you provide your services without that overhead cost. Right. So you may be paid less, but you don't have the overhead. So it should be that we could do both. Yes, I see. I wasn't accounting for overhead costs. And, you know, psychologists and doctors both have overhead costs, but I would think that doctors' overhead costs are probably quite a bit higher. Much more. And in fact, psychologists now, a lot of them have an app, so you can book your appointments through the app. They don't really need to hire a lot of staff. You come in, you have your appointment, you leave. So it's actually very tidy and really great for psychologists, and I'm happy for psychologists. I love psychologists. But uh, family doctors, we really need a system that takes care of overhead so family doctors can give the kind of care they want to give, that they were trained to give. But right now, the way it is with the, the, you know, the overhead being in the market system, it's just, it's just not feasible. What I'm hearing is that you're not going to change the diagnostic and treatment process in the primary physician's office. Unless you change how they're paid. So if we, right now we have a fee for service. So the patient comes in, you have a problem, you see the doctor, the doctor gets a fee. They have to have so many patients in a day to get their overhead and make a little more to live on. Right. Um, and in BC, there's a health crisis, right? Their family doctors have been closing their offices because they were not getting anywhere near, even after they paid all their overhead with all the real estate costs in BC, they were making almost minimum wage. So it's you if you go to a system where the physicians have an alternative remuneration plan where there's sort of a salary component to it, uh, the Alex Health Center, I think in Calgary, has something like that. Or there are capitation systems like Crowfoot Clinic has where there's a family doctor has a certain number of patients they're responsible for caring for and they're paid in, in a different way so that they can perhaps spend that time. So we have to look at different ways to incentivize both patients and physicians, you know, working together and, and solving these problems in a meaningful way instead of in a rushed way. It seems like the family doctor might just not want to even deal with these mental issues, rather preferring to just refer them on to uh, psychotherapists or psychiatrists, uh, those with specific training in matters of the mind. But those come with either long wait times or $200 an hour, neither of which improve access. So there are some therapists available through the public system um, in a limited way. So there's also sliding scale. I think Calgary Counseling Services has a sliding scale so that people can pay less if they don't have the same income. And um, there are some crisis clinics where people can access therapy and it is covered. But at, you, you are right. The, the, the family, some family doctors do not like to do therapy. Some do. And so that's where you find that people have different interests. Family doctors are all very different creatures. Yeah. But... At the end of the day, I think if you're booking a therapy session as a family doctor, you know, maybe booking that extra time is something that some family doctors are doing and others are, are not. And that's, that is doable. You can book counseling and book a bit more time. So that is something that, that patients and physicians, um, sometimes that does happen. So I can go to my family doctor and book an hour for therapy? You can't get an hour. No, I no. don't think you could get an hour unless you see what's called a GP psychotherapist. And that I, I don't have the details, but I do think those physicians, but again, they are a very small group. And most family doctors, we get psychiatry training. We get a limited amount of counseling and, and CBT training. A lot of us do training ourselves 
extra after we graduate. Um, but yeah, it's going to be quite varied out there. And, and, you know, we all know about walk-in clinics and, and it's quick medicine, right? So you're not going to get any therapy in that environment for right. sure. Right. Okay. It seems obvious that a highly informed holistic, uh, diagnostic tool could greatly assist the family physician in mental health uh, diagnosis and treatment. But even highly advanced tools can't deal with the onslaught of people that are coming to the fore today thinking that they have some kind of mental condition. What do you think is the fundamental cause of that? Oh, goodness me. That's a big question. So I think mental health um, is a big societal, issue. Let's do it. Societal mental health. Societal mental health is a big, big issue. I think a lot of it starts with our diet. I think if you look back in history when we had a healthier diet from the farm and, uh, you know, just didn't eat a lot of these processed foods, I would start there. I would say that's a huge impact on our mental health because a lot, be a lot of people are, quite frankly, addicted to sugar, which is more addictive than cocaine in some studies. That creates cycles of highs and lows, it affects the mood, it affects weight gain. When people have gained a lot of weight, they become more depressed and the cycle. There's also a lot of uh, overconsumption of caffeine and these energy products. Nobody's sleeping, right? So you have people aren't sleeping, they're eating 60% of the time they're eating processed food. And so you have highest rates of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and it's all interlinked. Do people with um, cardiac disease and stroke have higher rates of depression? Yes, they do. It's all interrelated. So do they have higher rates of depression before or after they find out they've got a cardiac condition? That's a very good question. Um, we definitely know that after the diagnosis, there's a much higher rate of depression diagnosed, but probably there was signs before and maybe that hasn't been looked at. So the idea of picking up something in advance of a condition developing is a valid concept. So why is it that we wait for a condition to fully develop before addressing it? Why is there no preventative approach? We have a disease focused system. We are not a preventative focused system. We need to be more preventative. We need to talk more about nutrition, exercise, you know, um, sleep. All of these things are huge factors in mental health that kind of people just want a pill instead of dealing with those things. And if, if we could show them, I mean, if you put Zoloft against exercise, exercise actually wins. Oh, it I... does better than Zoloft. So trying to get those messages across to people is very challenging. <laughs> I don't truly believe the cigarette companies and Coca-Cola and the media outlets have your mental health is their top priority. Their top priority is their profit. Can you talk a bit about world events and their effect on societal mental health generally? So mental health has been suffering. We have the internet, we have TV, we can see tragic events all around the world every day. I think actually watching the news can make your mental health suffer in some ways because there's just so many awful things that are going on in the world. Um, so that affects mental health for sure. Uh, the COVID was very hard, especially on, uh, I think, young people because they really lost a lot of that time to develop and to go to school and to interact and uh, so I, I really think we've been through a rough period. Now we've been pretty fortunate with not having you know world wars in the last many decades but the pandemic was definitely a very very difficult event for people with their mental health for sure. There seems to be a significant media bias toward reporting bad news. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a theory on that. So we have a negativity bias for survival. So we all are looking and scanning our environment for things that threaten our survival. And so as we evolve as humanity, we need to learn how to turn off those negative thoughts and that negative focus. And the media knows that fear sells. If you make people afraid of something, they will pay attention. So unfortunately, good news doesn't sell as well, which is terribly unfortunate. So once again, the driver's economics. And that about winds it up. Thank you, Dr. Duggan, for attending today and providing us with your valuable insights. So there you have it. Due to economic and time restrictions, primary physician diagnosis can be under-informed and may result in negative medication events. The system needs highly informed holistic diagnostic support tools. Number two, lack of access because those with specialized training are not covered by healthcare plans. Number three, poor lifestyles. This may be the primary cause of poor societal mental health. 
and this is unlikely to change as long as profit is the primary motivator. Thank you all for attending.